No, you're good. The, yeah. We've got six people who have responded on Mentimeter. Do I need to put the instructions up again? So that people can sign in? No. Oh, that'll QR code there. I still had it, but it just got grayed. Oh, no, keep it. Yeah, we're going to use it for the rest of the lecture. I'm going to try and use it more also. Future lectures, too, but you don't need to, like, keep the tab open between classes. Yeah, okay. Basically, everybody's saying, A, if I go back to the question, don't really need to calculate anything. We can calculate it, but what does this 2 mean compared to the B one in front of the B? Yeah. So this means I need twice as much A as I do B. So I need to use more A so the A gets used up more quickly. Twice as fast. And so by the end of the reaction, if I have the same amount of each, which is where this equal volumes, so same amount of each, then we're going to run out of A first. And this is one of those times where, most of the time, if you're given something like this, if you mix equal volumes, it's like an invitation to choose whatever volume you want. If you really wanted to calculate something. So what would be the easiest volume to pick? One liter, right? If I had one liter of each, now I've got enough numbers that I can actually calculate moles. So if I've got one liter of A, one liter of B, then I use the molarity, which is one mole of A for every one liter of A. Oops, sorry, should have done that the other way. One mole of A for every one liter of A. One mole of B for every one liter of B. And if we're calculating it to C, now this is where the two moles of A would give me one mole of C, whereas one mole of B gives me one mole of C. So we need twice as much A, or we're going to divide our amount by two so we can make less of C. So now we're changing gears a little bit. Talk about electrolytes, non-electrolyte solutions. I think I had a slide. Yeah, coming up, not quite yet. So electrolytes are substances that dissolve in water to form a solution that conducts electricity. That's why they're called electrolytes, because electricity. Generally, it's gonna be soluble ionic compounds. Non-electrolytes do not conduct water or do not conduct electricity when dissolved in water. So we're gonna have basically molecular compounds for the most part. And if you did, if you took Chem 20 here, then you probably did the lab where you had different solutions around the lab and you stuck them onto the electrodes of a light bulb and the light bulb lights up or the light bulb doesn't light up. A salt solution, there was a sodium chloride solution for that, that would have lit up. There was also a sugar solution and that should not have lit up. Lit up. Sometimes cross-contamination gives you bad results. All right, so some things conduct, some things don't. And actually, to here, so like soluble ionic compounds, they form or they conduct electricity because you'll have something like sodium, which will become Na plus and Cl minus ions. They have these charged ions in the solution. So I take something like sugar and I dissolve sugar, and this is the next Mentimeter slide. All right, so sugar dissolves, and then we've got these sugar molecules in the solution surrounded by water. But is sugar an electrolyte or a non-electrolyte? Really got all this stuff just right on the squeaky spot. So why is sugar a non-electrolyte? It dissolves in water just fine. But it's missing something that's required to conduct electricity. Ions. So when sugar dissolves, you only get molecules. These are just molecules of sugar. It's still the same sucrose molecule. The water has just separated the individual molecules, and there's no charges on that sucrose molecule, unlike ionic compounds. I have another question on this one. 
It's because it's still in, yeah, mostly because it's still intact. Whereas something like sodium chloride is going to be separated into ions, the positive and negative ions. Acids, and we're going to talk more about acids actually in the next, in the week seven slides, which we're going to get to shortly. Strong acids ionize completely. So you throw hydrochloric acid into water. Um, it is actually a molecular compound, but in water it separates completely into H plus and H minus, or Cl minus, sorry. Weak acids, on the other hand, only a small percentage of weak acid molecules actually ionize. So rather than getting a lot of H plus and a lot of F minus, you really get very little. And if you remember back to, again, that Chem 20 lab, for those of you who took it, we had some weak acids, thank God there was no hydrofluoric acid. Hydrofluoric acid is terrifying, by the way. It's one of the things I'm most afraid of, and unfortunately, we don't use any of it. Hydrofluoric acid was not there. This acetic acid, though, although I guess you had glacial acetic acid. Um, other weak acids, though, will produce a small amount of electrical current, and that depends on how much they ionize. So we're mostly going to talk about, for now, um, ionization and solubility in a bit in terms of does it dissolve or does it not? It's a qualitative approach. Does the light bulb light up or does it not? And so when we're considering these weak acids, these are ones that writing net ionic equations, they stay together. Is there a question? Oh, this arrow? Yeah, that's an equilibrium arrow. So in this reaction, there's some amount of hydrofluoric acid becoming hydrogen and fluoride ions, but there's also hydrogen and fluoride ions that are finding each other and then recombining back into HF. So it means that this reaction is constantly happening in both directions. Hydrochloric acid? Yeah, hydrofluoric acid and hydrochloric acid. How do you tell if one's a weak acid or a strong acid? Um, Honestly, it's easier to memorize the weak acids. At this point, you're just going to have to memorize them. The sort of deeper reason as to why is that fluorine is a much smaller atom. And so the hydrogen and the fluorine can get closer together, and they have stronger bonds, or a stronger bond between them, making it harder for the water to pull them apart. Whereas the hydrogen and chlorine, hydrogen and chloride ions, chloride so much larger that they can't get as close and their bond isn't as strong, so water has an easier time tearing them apart. And then acetic acid here is an organic acid. You can tell because it's got multiple carbons, multiple hydrogens. Those are almost all weak acids. So it's really HF and then in general, organic acids. I guess I said this already, but strong electrolytes dissolve completely. So any of our soluble ionic compounds are going to be strong electrolytes and then strong acids, uh, and they conduct electricity. Again, weak electrolytes only ionize partially. And really, that's only going to be weak acids. Is that actually the last slide? No, there's one more slide. Again, you can do these experiments where you try to pass current through a solution. If it passes current, then it's a uh, electrolyte. If it doesn't pass current, light bulb doesn't light up, not an electrolyte. See, the acetic acid, and this is a, an acetic acid solution, so it's aqueous, it's in water. So it does conduct electricity just a little bit. So you get a dim light from that. Okay. This is the last one that I have for these slides. So which aqueous solution conducts electricity? Find a faster way to switch between these. Hide responses. So yeah, sorry, go to Mentimeter. You'll be able to see most of it. Most of the Mentimeter stuff you'll see on the app. These are your choices though, A, B, and C. All right, that's probably enough responses. So yeah, A is the only one actually that conducts electricity here. And so that's potassium bromide, because that's an ionic compound. This is molecular, and this is molecular. 
Like I said, we're going to get to more about acids and bases, but this is just introducing these.